Hey everybody, welcome to Crosswinds Church, where we're all about this vision of growing closer to God and going into our worlds. No matter who you are or where you're joining us from, there's a place here for you. If you'd like to attend one of our services, you can go to cwcmv.org forward slash sermons to check out the times, upcoming sermons, as well as view previous sermons. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the service. Well, good morning. The title of today's message is You've Got to Bless Your Mess. And it comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So make sure you have a Bible handy. We'll be reading 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And you've streamed online just in time for some spring cleaning. You know, you and I live in a messy world. Uh, There's this global virus going on. And really, do you want me to spend time giving you another news update on that? I think not. We'll move on. The economy's in a downslide. There's a loss of jobs, and some people feel it more than others. Emotional issues abound in times of uncertainty, anxiety, worries, fears. There's relational problems. Maybe there's a rift going between you and your spouse, or the kids are not getting along. We live in a messy world, and I'm sure right now you are thinking of your own mess. I know I am, and no, I'm not thinking about your mess. I'm thinking about my mess. In fact, Fact, to keep it on a lighter note for a moment, uh, one of the messes we got ourselves into this last week is that on laundry day, get this guys, on laundry day, our washer went out. What's up with that? Why does it have to be on laundry day? Yes, our washer went out, and so I spent some time tearing it apart only to figure out the problem with it was a part called the agitator. You ever feel agitated by the messes that you find yourself in? It's not easy to follow God in a messy world. In fact, I think about the Disney Pixar movie, The Incredibles, and it's the story of this family of superheroes, and the leader, the the dad, says, I feel like the maid. I just cleaned up this mess. Can it stay clean for another 10 minutes? It'd be much easier to follow God. It'd be much easier to live this life if things just stayed cleaned up, but God never promised us a mess-free life. What he did promise us is he gave us some powerful tools to help us to clean up our world. And we find that in 2 Corinthians 10. So let's spend a moment in prayer and ask God to bless this time. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you how it speaks to us. Lord, we thank you that it is a, it's a timeless masterpiece. You've woven in through history, through the lives of men and women and children. Lord, you've woven in your gospel truth to tell one compelling narrative that has, for so many of us, saved us. It's brought us to the recognition that we need you, Lord. And it's given us a purpose beyond the grave. We thank you for it, God. And we pray that today, by your spirit, by your word, you'd speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's pick up 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1 and 2. Now I, Paul, myself, urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek with you face to face, but bold towards you when absent. I ask that when I'm present, I need not to be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some, who regard as if we walked according to the flesh." You see, the Corinthian church had their own mess. Their mess was relational, 
It was spiritual and it was even on a leadership level. They had what the apostle Paul sarcastically referred to as these quote, super apostles. There was nothing really super about them. Actually, they were false leaders that were bringing chaos to the church. Notice in these verses, he says, when I'm face to face with you, you think this way. When I'm absent, you think another way. But when I'm present with you, please don't make me have to come in there and clean up this mess. The truth is, he's returning to the church in Corinth and he's calling them to bless their own mess. And it's much like Jesus is returning to earth again and he expects you and I to do something about it. In fact, the the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, Jesus promises, yes, I am coming quickly. And he has work for you and I to do. He illustrates this point in Matthew chapter 25, verse one through six, he tells this short story about these 10 bridesmaids. He says, half of them were ready and half of them were not ready. Let's pick it up in verse one. Verse one. The kingdom of heaven will be like 10 bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the five who were wise took extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused and by the shout, look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. Imagine the trumpet being sounded to the last day. This is talking about the return of Jesus Christ. And verse 7 picks up saying, All the bridesmaids got up, prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps have run out. This reminds me of every high school group project that I've been part of. Half the people do the work, the other half are slackers. And they didn't do their work and now they're looking for the ones who are the achievers to pick up their slack. Well, the achievers replied in verse 9 and said, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were out to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. And it was too late for those Jesus wraps this up by saying in verse 12, he calls back to them, believe me, I don't know you. And then he gives an application for you and I. So you too must keep watch for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. Jesus is returning again and he tells this parable of the bridesmaids, 10 bridesmaids, which could have easily been called the parable of the five procrastinators. It reminds me of when I was growing up, my mom gave me a list of chores to do and they weren't hard, they weren't unachievable. It was something I could do. And she expected these things to be done before she returned home from work. Well, I being a young boy would wait for the sound of the garage door to open. Once the garage door opened, I said, oh no, T minus five, four, three, two, one. I got to get these dishes done. So I'd go, I quickly start washing these dishes and my mom would no fail walk in on me many times and say, son, what are you doing? And I look at her and say, dishes? (laughs) Just I I know what you're doing. Why are you doing them right now? I say, I forgot. I didn't even believe my own excuse. And that's the case for when Jesus returns. Many people at that point are not going to believe their own excuses because God has given us a clear mission in life to know him and to make him known. In other words, to give our life to Jesus Christ and get on with the mission to bless our mess. Well, there's two types of people listening this morning. Some of you are being obedient to Christ To the best of your ability, of God's ability working through you, and in the grace of God, you are seeking him, you're praying, you're serving him. So this message should encourage you to keep going. But then there's others who are disobedient. You're not seeking God. You're not praying. You're not reading. You're not serving. You're not doing any of those things. You're living for you. And this message should convict you. In verse 1 and 2, as we read, the apostle Paul said, I urge you. I'm asking you to do this. Well, we use that word urge in, in, a, 
in this way. It's like suppressing the urge to laugh. She couldn't resist and so milk shot out of her nose. (laughs) Or urge for thirds at the buffet were beyond his control. So up for the rigatoni he rose. See that? I could be a poet. (laughs) That was a great little rhyme there. But the word urge, how the Apostle Paul used it, was in the Greek parakaleo, which means I'm calling you to my side. I'm calling you, exhorting you, begging you. I, I, I desire this for you and I'm praying. Listen to what I have to say to you. It's the similar word for the Holy Spirit, parakletos. It's, it's, in fact, it means the same thing. The Holy Spirit calls us to his side, to God. It reminds me of Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1. Listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you. You think your situation is unique, but it's not. God, for at least 6,000 years of human history, depending on how you look at the timeline, he has dealt with the mess of humanity. There's nothing new to him. So if you say no to his urgent call over your life, you're keeping him at arm's length. But when you say yes to God, you're drawn in by his urgent call. You're drawn in by his arm to his side. The problem with the church in Corinth And why their mess took over is because they took a passive role. They looked at Christianity as a spectator sport. Oh, the leaders will do the work. But they had work that God had called them to do. And Paul, this apostle, this church planter who's writing them, even though he was being accused by these false teachers of being weak, he at least was willing to stand up and do something. I love that about him. That's leadership. That's Christianity to stand up and do something. When I was in junior high, I was a sixth grader. I I had my brand new backpack on. I had my fresh clothes, my back to school clothes. And I I was walking through the campus and I walked through this, this one place, which I didn't know at the time was called the eighth grade wall. Being a sixth grader, this was a no-no. I shouldn't have walked over there. And I walked down this little slope between this wall and an eighth grader pushed me and said, don't you know this is the eighth grader wall? (laughs) And I don't know what came over me, the little punk that I was. I pushed the kid back and I said, well, it's not anymore. (laughs) What was I thinking? I could have got beat up. But you know what happened? He actually respected me for doing something and we became friends. I was an insider now with the eighth graders. Go figure. I'm not necessarily recommending that to every sixth grader, but at least I did something. As leaders, As Christians, we don't avoid our mess in life. That's not an option. Look, nobody's blessed when you you sweep your own mess under the carpet. And nobody's blessed when you expect somebody else to clean up your mess. Men, men of the family, your family will only thrive under your leadership when you stand up and do something for God. And ladies, your, your men will thrive in the household when you encourage him. And when he stands up, don't critique him. We're in an interesting season right now where people are focusing more on the home and we have a chance to rewire some things. Well, families, people of God, you have a chance right now. God's got a message for you. It's time for you to bless your mess. And God's given us three powerful cleanup tools in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Today we're going to talk about. But I was thinking about this little tool right here. It doesn't look like much. This is called a spade bit. Yesterday, my family, my wife and kids, they were out in the back and they're putting together a garden. And they had these big, these big planter buckets and there's a real thick gauge. And they're trying to break these things open to you know, create some holes in the bottom for irrigation. I thought, oh my gosh, I know I have a tool that's going to be great for this. I got my spade bit. But you see, this tool on its own is not good unless you have a driver, a drill. And this drill could be like our life. You've got the tool, you've got your life, but you press it, it's got no power. You've got the Spirit of God on the inside of you all of a sudden. You're ready to, for some irrigation, baby. 
That's right, that's right. The power of God. You've got the weapon, you've got the tool, you've got your life, you've got the power of God working through it and it just makes me want to build something. It makes me want to drill something. It makes me want to do something with my life and that's my hope for you this morning. Let's read verse three through six. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we're taking every thought captive and making it obedient to Christ. And we're ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. The first powerful tool to help you clean up your mess is God's artillery. Or if you want to use the word weapon, that's fine. Same thing there. You notice in verse 3, he says, yes, we're human, but that's not the way that we war. You see, I can admit that I'm flesh. I can admit that I have a mess. I can admit that I'm human. I, I, I can admit I'm not above anybody else. I'm not above God. I have my own problems. I have my failures. There's freedom in being able to admit those limitations, those weaknesses. But the reason why we boast in those weaknesses, we can be honest, we can be humble, but we don't want to be limited. We want the power of God to rest upon our weaknesses. In Christ, God has given us mighty weapons. That's what these verses are saying. Mighty weapons to be able to use in our life to see things happen. Verse four says, this power, this artillery is powered by God himself. And look at this list here. The world has weapons. It's called faith in humanity. They believe that humanity is basically good. And they're they're banking on that. That's not really the reality. A Christian's response is saying, yeah, there's good in the world, but it's also messed up. We put our faith in God. People can be unreliable, but God is unchanging. The world's weapons, they go off of popular opinion. What do you think? What do you think? What does this news source think? Well, that's not what the Christians go off, we go off of timeless truths. We look to the Bible. This thing has not failed us for thousands of years. It's only triumphed and it will triumph beyond when we go to be in eternity. Uh, the world has surrendering to social media. I'm just going to talk about my problems and, and, and blast them out there on social media. And hopefully someone's going to feel bad for me and help me out there. Well, we surrender not only to people. Of course, we can talk about our problems to people. But we surrender first and foremost to God. That's a powerful weapon. The world uh, goes after cultural gurus, looking for, looking for these personalities or celebrities to speak hope into their life. Well, maybe there's some good there, but maybe there's a mixed bag as well. The Christian, we seek God's presence daily and say, okay, my creator, what do you have for my life? The world's weapons, they kill for their best life now. We don't do that. We worship in the mess and we worship in the blessing. The world will love those who love them. A Christian will love our neighbors, whether they're good to us or they're bad to us. We still smile at them and we say, I love you because God loves you. The world will blaspheme the name of Jesus, thinking that's powerful, thinking that's cool. Not the Christian. We honor and we pray in the name of Jesus, knowing that that is a powerful weapon for our life. Well, we see a variety of weapons at our disposal, To highlight some of them, again, faith, the word of God, surrender, seeking him, worshiping, loving, honoring, and praying in the name of Jesus. There's effects to these weapons. And we also see that in verse 4 to 6 that we just read. The first effect is that you're going to destroy fortresses. This is strongholds of human reasoning. You can destroy speculations. This is reasoning that's hostile to the faith. You can destroy lofty things. That's things that elevate themselves above God. And lastly, another effect is that we can take every thought captive. Anything that tries to oppose to God. Let me put it this way. The effects of this artillery is this. Anything that would keep you or keep your world back from God is something that can be taken down in the name of Jesus using that powerful artillery that God has given you. You ever wonder why there's unconfessed patterns of sin in the church or Christians who walk in unforgiveness or or some are just controlled daily by worry and fear and anxiety or or the reason why sometimes the baptismal stays unfilled and, and unbelievers stay unsaved. Why is this? Maybe 
It's because many of us Christian Americans, we, we prayed this prayer to get out of hell, real, forgetting to realize that that prayer was designed for us to wake up every morning and destroy hell for a living. That's our calling. We're supposed to destroy these strongholds, pull them down, anything that opposes God. We are in a spiritual battle and God's given us mighty weapons to battle with. Look at 1 John 3.8. Jesus appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 4, 17, just a chapter later, he says, Because as Jesus is, because as he is, so are we in this world. Your mess is not going to bless itself. And God has put you and your family, with your friends, with your coworkers, with your class, classmates. God has put you in those places. God is giving you mighty weapons to stand up and bless something. That's the first powerful tool. The second is this, God's authority. And we see this in verse seven and eight. Paul says to the church in Corinth, you are looking at things as, as they are outwardly. If anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ, let him consider this again within himself, that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast somewhat further about our authority, there's that word, which the Lord gave for building you up and not destroying you, I will not be put to shame. See what he's using those weapons for? He says, I'm, I'm going to destroy fortresses. I'm not going to destroy you. I'm going to build you up. And he says, you're just looking at things outwardly. You need to realize that there's authority when we belong to Christ. Now, I can get caught up in my own deal. Like, I showed a picture of a phone here, and obviously this is not my phone, because I don't know about you, but on my phone, my settings is not called Einstelugen. <laughs> this has got to be German, right? But I think about this phone and I think about what I produce with my phone. Right now I'm doing a lot of ministry on my phone, social media and things like that. Well, I can easily get caught up in how many people liked it, how many people commented, how many people shared that thing. And I need to remember that that's only looking at the outward. I need to look at the way that God's looking at things. See, look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. I need to look through my phone. I need to look through the things that God's doing through his authority and imagine there's someone on the other side. There's maybe at least one other person that's streaming this morning that's being blessed, that's being challenged, that's, that's getting excited about what God can do in you. That's the thing we need to look at. Think about your own life. Don't look at just the outward appearance of does it look successful or not. Look at the inward appearance. Look at Christ. Look at the fact that you belong to him if you've surrendered your life to him. And if you've surrendered your life to Jesus, oh man, if you surrendered your life to Jesus, you belong to him and his authority rests on your life. Let me say one thing about that. If you feel like, how do I do that? How do I actually start with God? How do I actually give my life to him? It's, it's, it's easy to remember, but it's not easy to do. It's this, you admit, admit that I do have a mess in my life. You believe, believe that God is powerful enough to enter into your mess and do something about it. And then you choose, you choose to surrender, make Jesus the master of your messy own little world. And you could do that today. You could admit to God. You can get right with him. You can believe. You can, you can choose him. You can do that today and start this day brand new with God. Even as we're talking right now, say, God, I, I want you to forgive me of my sins. I, I don't want to just live for me. I want to live for you. I surrender to you. I want to be welcomed into your kingdom. I want your mighty artillery. I want your mighty authority working in and through me to do what this preacher is talking about today. Again, the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outside. God looks at the inside, at the heart. He sees your heart, what's going on right now. And this is encouraging because if you think about the Apostle Paul who wrote 2 Corinthians, he, was, he is the poster child for church planters today. But think about this. Church history tells us he was short. Church history actually tells us he was about three and a half cubits high. Three and a half cubits, what does that mean? A cubit is 18 inches. If you multiply that by three, that's five foot three inches. He was short. It says, church history says that he had crooked legs. 
and, and that he had a gray hair and a gray beard. Maybe he was a cross between, I don't know, <laughs> but moving on, he even said about himself, I'm not the best preacher. So how did God use a guy like the Apostle Paul to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth? How did that work? Because it's not about the outward. He recognized it himself. I belong to Christ. There's a powerful indwelling spirit of God that is filling me up for service. And that's the same thing we have, the spirit of Jesus Christ. Look how powerful Jesus is. Revelation chapter eight, verse one says this. When Jesus broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Can you imagine that? Silence in heaven for about a half hour because Jesus broke the seal. What's going on in this passage? The seventh seal is, is the thing that was going to usher in the very last moments before Jesus was re- going to return. And in the book of Revelation, they make a big deal out of who's going to break the seal? Who's going to break the seal? And they're looking around. Who's it going to be? There's only one that was powerful enough to break the seal, and it was Jesus himself, the Lion of Judah. He breaks the seal, and it ushers in the very last moments. So powerful a moment this was that it disrupted heaven for a half hour. Now, that baffles me, and I'm not even sure exactly what that means, because how do you measure time and timeless eternity? But there was something that happened. There was a moment there where, where they said, something just got rattled in all of heaven. No one in earth, no one in heaven could do this, but Jesus did it. Jesus is powerful. And you think about the highest power above the earth, above the heavens, the highest power, I belong to him? It's amazing. It's amazing. There's a few verses I want to look at that, that prove how this authority wants to move in our life. Matthew chapter 9, verse 8. When the crowd saw this, they saw that Jesus healed a paralyzed man. They were awestruck. They glorified God and they said, who, they glorified him because they said, who had given such authority to men. You see, Jesus, when he came to earth, wasn't just God. I mean, yes, he was God, but he was also man. Fully God, fully man. And the emphasis they saw here is how could God give to man such authority? And Jesus in Matthew 28 says, I want you to have that same authority. All authority has been given to me, Jesus says to his followers in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go. Go to your world. Take this mess and bless it. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we see all things, meaning even authority, belong to you because you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. I wonder if this morning God's saying, is there anybody listening who's going to be bold enough to destroy some walls? Anyone who's going to be bold enough to destroy some doubts? Anyone who's going to be bold enough to destroy some attitudes? Anybody who's going to be bold enough to take those thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ? I believe that if you get this message this morning, you're going to see his powerful weapons, his powerful authority in your life as you just go and believe him for it. And you're going to see some walls coming down in your life. And you're going to see some walls coming down in the lives of the people around you. Now, yesterday, I didn't have this on my notes, but yesterday, the Lord brought this to my mind. I spent some time, just me and him, I I put everything aside. And I'll tell you, some walls began to come down as I didn't spend just a minute or two or five or 10, but I spent some significant time in the Lord's presence. Some walls came down in my life and it's the same thing that God wants you to do in yours. There's powerful authority available in Christ. I remember being with a friend and we were shopping at a store and uh, we were exercising this authority, you could say, in Jesus to go and bless some people in the store. So we started sharing the gospel and praying for needs and things like that. And we were excited because it was going really well. Then we exited the store and on the way out, we came across a homeless woman, much like the picture you see here. And I asked my friend, do you have time for one more person to bless? Well, as we began walking up to her, she was writhing and she was spitting and she was cursing and she was blaspheming God and she was mocking us. This is... This seems to be going beyond mental illness. This this seems to be an evil presence that there was a demonic influence over this woman's life. And I was thinking it, but my friend began acting in the authority. He began to cast out whatever evil presence was over this woman's life. And I thought, all right, this is already getting crazy. I might as well jump in. So I jumped in. I began doing the same thing. We're praying over this woman as she's not even responding at all to us. In a matter of what felt like a long time, but in all reality, it was probably about a minute. 
her countenance changed. All of a sudden, there was something that just shifted, spiritually speaking. She stopped cursing. She stopped writhing. She stopped all of these things, literally spitting. She stopped doing all those things. And she began crying. And for the first time, she looked at us in the eyes and she said, thank you. Thank you. This woman was bound by evil and she was thanking us that God had released her from this. What happened? We were just walking in the authority that Jesus gives. So we shared the gospel with her and we told her there's a way for her to never be bound up by that evil again. How powerful is that? (laughs) Praise be to God. Let's move on to verse 9 through 11. He said, For I I do not wish to seem as if I would terrify you by my letters. Verse 10, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech is contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in letters when absent, such persons will also be indeed when present. You see what he says here? What we're going to be in letters when we're absent, we're also going to be in person when we're present. If it's in God's word, it can show up in my life. And if it happens in the church, it can show up in my messy world. That's the authority that God puts on the life of a believer. The third powerful tool we've talked about is artillery. We talked about his authority. Now we're going to talk about his approval. And one of the biggest misconceptions, I want to start by saying this, one of the biggest misconceptions about salvation we see in our culture is that people think it has to be, they have to be approved by their own good works. Somehow I have to work for this. Somehow I have to achieve this. I need to have my, my good outweigh my bad. And then maybe somehow God will accept me and I'll be into heaven. Well, I want to show you a short video of a preacher that goes out of his way to show a few young ladies that that is not the truth. I don't know if you can realize this, but I care about you ladies. I care about where you spend eternity. And I don't want you to end up in hell. And you could leave here and want to get killed in a car accident, die in your sleep tonight. And that would wake you up and you say, man, this is serious. Jesus died for our sins, paid the fine so we could leave the courtroom, rose from the dead, defeated death. And all you have to do to find everlasting life is repent of your sins and trust in Jesus. Do you know what repentance is? Yes. It's when you confess and forsake your sins. You don't say, I'm a Christian, but you lie and steal and fornicate and blaspheme. That, that's playing the hypocrite. Right, you, you've got to be genuine. No, you've, you've missed what I'm saying. These ladies are listening. You just want to wait for a minute. So what do you think about what we talked about? Repent and trust in Jesus. Um, one, other, one other illustration before I finish. If you were going to jump out of a plane 10,000 feet, why would you put on a parachute? To save our lives. And your motivation be fear. You don't want to hit the ground at 120 miles an hour on your face. Fear is your friend in that respect, not your enemy. And I've tried to make you ladies fearful today because I know that that fear can be your friend, not your enemy. If you realize this is is deadly serious. Death is deadly serious. Facing God on judgment day is deadly serious. I need to be honest. Let that fear be your friend, not your enemy, and drive you to seek God's mercy. Does this make sense? Yes, thank you. If you notice in that video, this young lady who was highlighted in the video is listening. Uh, She's soul searching. She's, she's, she's just, you could just see it in her. But the friend chimes in and says, all right, we'll work on being better people. He's like, no, 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 you missed it. Now, would you just hold on for a second? These ladies are listening. That that was a powerful moment in that. She, She almost hijacked it with this idea of, okay, yeah, I'll be better. I'll be better. I'll be better. And some of you might be hearing that today, but what you need to hear is that God's grace, his goodness, you don't deserve could enter your life so that you could have access to God, his artillery, his, his authority, and now his approval over your life. It's an amazing thing that we don't work for, but that we receive when we walk with him. Read verse 12 through 14 here. He says, for we are not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves. But when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they're without understanding. But we will not boast beyond our measure, but within the measure of the sphere which God apportioned to us as a measure to reach even as far as you. For we are not overextending ourselves as if we did not reach to you. For we were the first to come to you even as far as the gospel of Christ. Here he says, you're comparing yourselves with yourselves and you're without 
understanding. Be careful of this works-based comparison, who's better, who's worse sort of thing. If you're only looking around doing that, it's going to end you in, in one of two places. One is pride. That's when you feel like I'm not as bad as them. And then you're actually rejoicing when other people fail because it helps you to feel like your position is still intact. Be careful of that. The other in comparing yourself, the pitfall is insecurity. Feel like you're never as happy as the rest of the world. And then you're going to end up throwing yourself an endless pity party and inviting people on Facebook to join you in that pity party. You don't want that. That's not the life that God has for you. You need God's approval. And the best part of God's approval is that it's free. It's that Jesus came to this earth. God came in the form of human and he died on a cross so that all of your failures, all of your sin, everything you've done wrong could be nailed to that cross. And Jesus buried it in a grave and he rose from the grave showing he's more powerful than those things. He's even more powerful than death itself so that you could rise with him as well. Put it this way. God's approval is like this. Stay so close to God that he's holding this umbrella and his umbrella covers your life. You're approved because of who you're with, not because of who you are. It's kind of like reminds me of my kids. They're fantastic artists. They like to color these things. And lately they've been putting these little art shows on and, and having this contest. I think it's so fun. But they asked me, Dad, would you, would you tell us who did a better job on these things? And let me just tell you, they know it. I know it. I am a terrible judge of my daughters as to who's better than the other. Because I look at them and I say, you both are just like the best artists. I, I, I love the work you put forward. And, and so they'll bring them to me and, I, and, and I'll say, hey, both of you did a great job on this. They say, I, I know, Dad, I know. They know I'm going to say that because it's true. I approve of them. They're my daughters. I love them. Well, God, being a heavenly father, says this is how you ought to work in this life. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Notice, it didn't say work hard for your salvation, the results of your salvation. Another translation says work out your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence. That's worship and fear. Not fear that you're going to lose your salvation, but respect for God. Uh, realizing he's holy and he loves me and that matters. So I'm going to work for this. You would work out your muscles because you already have a body. You would work for a paycheck because you already have a job and you would work out your salvation because you already are standing under the umbrella of God's approval. Well, verse 13 and 14, notice, remember it said, we will not, well, we will boast within our sphere because we were the first to arrive. The last thing you need to do is get outside of your sphere. The last thing you need to do is start critiquing someone else's life or someone else's ministry. Oh, I could do better than them. I can't believe they did that. And it's constantly this critique. You're gonna, all that's going to do is lead you to further unhappiness. You should boast within your own sphere. You should clean up your own world. Start listing the people that you know. Start praying for them daily. Begin investing in their life. Get on the mission that way. Invite them to know the God who's approved you. And then represent Jesus everywhere you go by the way that you live. Be a first responder, a gospel first responder to the eight to 15 people that God's put in your life. The other day, I was at the seafood market with my family and one of the clerks there uh, was wearing a mask as I was wearing a mask as well. And I said, hey, could you tell me what you think about this whole coronavirus thing? He said, oh, I'm just trying to be careful. I got my, my kid at home and I, I got my wife at home and I just, I just need to be careful. I said, well, are you afraid? He said, well, of course. I mean, people could die. My family could die. I said, so are you ready for that point when you die? Do you know what's going to happen? He said, uh, question mark, eternal sleep? I don't know. I said, you don't sound too confident about that. I said, what if I was to tell you that I know the truth of God? Would you be willing to listen to me for a minute in that? And he was totally open to it. He said, yeah, I'd love that. I said, have you ever heard about the cross? Have you heard about Jesus? Have you heard about God coming down to earth? And as I told him that, I said, Jesus is fully God. He's fully man. He represented God. He represents us. He brings us together. He goes, oh, 
He goes, it's like, is it like he, he's playing both sides of the field? I said, you're starting to get it. And God allowed me to share the gospel with this guy. We can be gospel responders, first responders to the people in our world. Verse 15 and 16. He says, not boasting beyond our measure, that is in other men's labors, but with the hope that as your faith grows, we will be within our sphere enlarged even more by you. So as to preach the gospel, even to the regions beyond you and not to boast in what has been accomplished in the sphere of another. I think what he's getting at here is he's saying, we want to get up. We want to bless our mess. Well, you're within the sphere of our own little messy world. And as we bless you, we believe that your faith is going to grow. Our faith is going to grow and the territory is going to enlarge. It's going to build you up in the faith so that you can stand on your own two gospel feet and then you can go and share with others so that us preaching to you is going to then preach to others through you. And this is why I'm preaching to you this morning. My prayer and my hope is that you grow in your faith in Jesus Christ and then you go to your worlds and do something with that faith. And this is who we are, right, Crosswinds? We're the people who grow with Jesus and go to our worlds. Can I get an amen in the chat? That's who we are. That's what we're going to do. So go and tell your world there's a better artillery. There's a better authority and there is a better approval. His name is Jesus. It's a wonderful, wonderful God. You know, right now it's like we're missionaries online. And it's like we're missionaries in our home. In the leadership here, we have some thoughts about what that's going to look like in the weeks moving forward. We want to engage you and we want you to engage your world. And so chances are you're going to hear more about this. This idea of being missionaries online and in our home. So be praying about that as we begin developing some of those ideas. Uh, We'll finish with verse 17 and 18. He who boasts should boast in the Lord. For it is not he who commends himself that is approved, but he whom the Lord commends. There you have it. If you're going to boast... A boast in the Lord. All that matters at the end of my life is God saying, I'm glad you didn't waste your time considering everybody else's mess. I'm glad you didn't sweep your own mess under the carpet. I'm glad that you didn't expect somebody else to bless your mess. Look, you trusted me. You got up. You were the one to bless your mess. Don't you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Look, take these tools. Take the power of God. Use your life. Use the tools that God's given you and get to work. Do something for the Lord. He believes you can do it. Otherwise, he would not have said it in his word. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the mission that you've given us. We thank you so much for the reality that our lives are saved in Jesus' name, that all of our sins are covered You remember them no more. You've thrown them as far as the east is to west. You're not bringing them up anymore. When you look at my life by faith in grace, you see Jesus. And that's incredible to me. That gives me hope. That gives me courage. That gives me everything I need in order to move forward, to pick up that artillery, pick up that authority, pick up that approval, and know that my God loves me. And Father, I pray that that makes a dent in our life. That makes an impact so much so that each and every one of us grabs a hold of this vision to work within the sphere that you've given us. Lord, we want to see strongholds come down. We want to see those who are stuck in sin, worry, that that don't have their eternal destination figured out. We want to see these people become free in Jesus. And so we pray right now, Holy Spirit of God, fill us. Fill me with the faith. Fill me, my life, with these weapons to build people up and destroy the things that keep them from you. Fill my life with your approval so I can walk each and every day, not listening to the lies of the enemy, but listening to your truth, which you declare over my life. Bless every one of my brothers and sisters who are listening this morning. We love you and we praise you. And as we give our tithes and offerings to you, whew, It's just a, it's all it is is worship because you've given us so much. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray, amen.
Here at Crosswinds, we believe this vision of growing and going can change your life and the world around you. Crosswinds Church is a nonprofit, which means it operates from gifts given from people just like you. When you give, your money goes to creating opportunities for people to grow and go all over the world. I would love for you to be a part of that. And you can give a gift right now by clicking on the Give button in the top right corner of this page, or you can go to cwcmv.org slash give. Join us and join what God is doing through this vision of growing and going, and have a great day.